Thanks very much, uh, Carol, for that uh, great in invitation and introduction. And uh, I said I didn't mind Dora sitting in the background looking over my shoulder as I speak. That's, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I actually do enjoy uh, working uh, with Doris and RNAO. They, uh, your organization, I think, was one of the first to contact me when I became health critic. And uh, uh, it's been ongoing ever since. And I really do appreciate the information. Not only here in Toronto, I've participated in a few events in my, my riding and in London. And it's just been tremendous. Um, Greg's here from my office. And uh, he wants to thank you for all those emails you send us every day. <laughs> <laughs> but it really, really shows uh, your, your work in advocating uh, uh, for patients in Ontario, and I think uh, that's a uh, tremendous uh, uh, to be a part of that and to always remind the government and opposition members uh, that we can't forget the healthcare system is for the patient. It's not for the bureaucrat and it's not for a pol political party to look good. It's to focus on the patient. We must never lose sight of that. And I'm so glad RNAO with Doris and the group is there uh, to ensure we don't forget that focus. So I, I'm, I'm proud to be here to speak. Usually um, our leader gets to speak at these events and uh, as you may know, uh, our party is undergoing a leadership campaign as we speak. So um, I was uh, giving the, uh, the, the role to come and speak to you as, role as, as the health critic and um, I, I truly appreciate the opportunity uh, to do so. And uh, we do know that uh, we had released a platform uh, last November uh, at our convention, which I think was uh, quite a tremendous platform, which had a substantial amount of information and policy regarding health care, which uh, I believe was uh, probably the first time in decades uh, that our party has really put forth a uh, solid policy in health care. And I'm glad that we're part of that conversation. Again, I think Ontario and the health care system is much stronger when all three parties are, are putting uh, their thoughts and ideas forward uh, with regards to the health care of the province. Uh, and I do know uh, with a number of our leadership candidates, uh, with the health care portion of our platform, I haven't heard any of them say that they were against or wanting to change any part of that platform. And I think that's tremendous that uh, it, it will still be a good part portion of the progressive conservative policy going forward into the election this coming June. And uh, I thought I would go over that platform with you. Uh, however, as I said, we're still working on a leader. Uh, um, I'll let you know that uh, I'm supporting uh, Carolyn Mulrooney for the leadership. And my number two pick is Christine Elliott, who I support in the 2015 election. So my hope is one of those two ladies is our leader going forward. And, uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful at that time that uh, we'll reemphasize our health care policy and going forward. Um, maybe have a few tweaks with it, but I thought I'd go over what we have just, just so you know what we have planned out uh, for this June. And I'd also like to, to recognize that uh, the platform was created over 15 months and it reached out to all Ontarians. It just wasn't PC party members. Uh, we received much information. And in fact, our, our policy advisory committee, which I was co-chair with Francesca Grosso, uh, did include RNs. So we had our ends at the table in developing our policy. And uh, we look forward to having an opportunity to implement that policy. But the core fo focus of our, of our platform was, of course, to uh, make patient care a priority, uh, reduce red tape, uh, and reduce uh, the layers and layers of administration and re redeploy that dollar back down to the front lines. That's the key goal, is to uh, ensure that our frontline uh, healthcare workers, providers, have the supports available and necessary to them in order to fulfill their role uh, as a healthcare professional. And we're gonna tackle that over uh, a number of issues, but the main goal uh, of the platform was reducing wait times in Ontario. And by looking at the problem areas in the province, that fixing those areas would lead to reduce wait time. So our first point was on hospital overcrowding. Uh, and you, you live it, you talk to your colleagues, our, our hospitals are bursting at the seams. And the CAIHI report from 2017 noted that Ontario has some of the longest wait times uh, for medical attention in acute care settings. And that's comparing them to uh, 10 other countries. And 
You and I both know that we don't like to be uh, near the bottom of a list in Ontario healthcare. We don't want our patients waiting uh, more than they need to. It's completely unacceptable. Uh, too many patients were waiting in emergency departments, uh, in rooms, in hallways far too long in order just, just to see uh, a, a, a health practitioner. And I've had uh, RNs in my office in St. Thomas uh, uh, come to speak to me about the violence that is creating in the healthcare system. When you don't have enough space for patients to wait, you have the increase in, in uh, patients with mental illness coming into the emergency departments who have nowhere else to turn. Um, there's quite the increased chance of, of uh, violence in the workplace. And, and this, this RN, um, when she came to see me, she was off work. Uh, she was beaten so bad in the emergency department. She had concussions. She had, uh, I think they broke her nose, cra fractured her face. And all she was trying to do was do her job, was look after patients. And uh, um, we need to do better as uh, uh, government and policy and ensuring the supports are there so that we uh, have a safe workplace for everyone to work at. So we're, we're committing as a PC party to, to ease the pressure on our hospitals so we can have uh, timely care. And the way you ease the pressure in the hospitals is to work at building up uh, community services, building up uh, our home care services, building up the, uh, the associations and nonprofit organizations that serve patients, uh, whether it be with mental health, whether it be youth, uh, but ensuring that the community is strong. We've, we've moved so quickly, and I'll say quickly, for politics over 20 years, 25 years at, at closing hospital beds, but at the same time, we didn't provide the adequate support in our community to support those patients when they no longer could go into the hospital. And one of our main commitments uh, with building up the home care system uh, was to ensure that the care coordinators are actually moved out of the Lynn offices and put into the community to where they should be doing is coordinating that care, ensuring that the circle of care is around the patient. And we can't do that until those care coordinators. The government's promised to do so. We need action on that issue. We will provide that action if we're fortunate to form government. Long-term care is another issue. Uh, with regards to overcrowding in our hospitals. The Auditor General's report from last year stated there's over 4,000 patients, ALC patients, in our hospital system. They're taking up the beds. They shouldn't be there. They need to be elsewhere. Our home care system isn't built up uh, strong enough to take those patients home, but at the same time, we don't have the space in our long-term care. And, uh, and unfortunately, too many seniors uh, are either being placed in the hospital and not moving, or they're sent home to dangerous conditions where only their family is able to look after them. And uh, a lot of families don't have the ability or the means uh, to look after those patient members. So they're, they're, unfortunately, there's not enough uh, uh, spaces in our, our long-term care to do so. Um, the wait list now is up to over 32,000 people. And within the next five years, they're, they're saying it'll be up to 50,000 people waiting for a wait list. My riding, Elgin, Middlesex, London, it's at least a three-year wait when you decide that you, you think it's time to go into a, a long-term care home. And uh, personally speaking, uh, my, my, my dad is going to be 90 in another month, and my mom is 86 in May. Um, they were ready to go to a nursing home a year ago, but it's just not going to happen. Um, so we're doing the best we can. I have a big family, there's six of us, six kids, so we, we take our turn taking care of our parents and, and, and hoping uh, uh, we can make do with uh, uh, what we have. And, and unfortunately, I think there's many families that are unfortunately have to do so. Uh, in, our, in our platform, we're, we're promising to try to fill up that void and uh, we're committing to build over 30,000 beds in the next 10 years, but 15,000 of those beds will be built in the next five years. Um, we, we think it's very important to have those spaces available uh, so that uh, there's options for families and those ALC beds can decrease. And again, the, the PC party does uh, uh, agree with the RNAO that we need to look at the funding model for long-term care, strengthen the overall support and ensure that we have the proper uh, nursing RN, uh, RPN, and PSW staffing ratios in our, nurse, in our homes. And we, we should look at uh, the ability of uh, how do we involve nurse practitioners uh, in our long-term care sector. The other item that we've uh, spoken of, oh. I, I need to bring Doris to all my campaign stops. If she's available for May, it'd be great. 
Another commitment that uh, I know is uh, very near and dear to your hearts, and it's in your, uh, your, uh, your booklet that uh, you, you produced today, uh, is dental care for low-income seniors. Um, many of our seniors are on fixed income and can't afford the oral health. Um, minor aches become serious issues, and there's nowhere for them to turn but emergency departments. Where do you go? How many dentists have I spoken to, dental hygienists, where it's a recurring theme that uh, a senior will get uh, either an infection or have pain in their gums or in their, their mouth, go to the emergency department, emergency department can give them has some antibiotics and maybe some pain medication, which, you know, then that takes you down a different path. If you go often enough, then you worry about opioid addiction down the road. Um, but you don't deal with what's causing the issue. So, so many years that uh, uh, we haven't really dealt with this issue, um, how expensive it is for someone to continually use our emergency department to deal with uh, uh, an issue uh, in your mouth, because you can't afford to go to the dentist. Um, instead of dealing with the root costs, we continually pour money continually over and over instead of dealing with the root costs. How much of that money could actually, if you stopped the need of people having to utilize emergency departments, and put that money into the dental program, would you not only have uh, decreased costs in the system, decrease the burden on our emergency departments, but think of the quality of life that you'd improve for seniors in our province. So our commitment uh, in the, uh, our platform is an oral health program and we're estimating to serve over 100,000 low-income seniors uh, going forward uh, when we're, of course, uh, able to form government. Uh, with regards to pharmacare, uh, I can uh, clearly uh, admit to this group that uh, all the candidates uh, uh, have confirmed their support of OHIP Plus, and uh, we will continue. Um, I, I'm a pharmacist by, by trade, and, and I've dealt with the Ontario drug benefit system uh, for a long time, and uh, it, it needs, uh, needs some updating. It needs to be fixed. There's currently six or seven different plans uh, the government uh, has put out there uh, there's no reason why we can't streamline the administration and, and bring it under uh, one, one plan, one administration. I think uh, if you look at a national pharmacare model, we're hoping it's one administration, one plan for everybody, and that's what we need to do in Ontario. Uh, I know the EAP process, emergency access uh, process for medications uh, is too uh, burdensome. Uh, it takes too long to actually uh, access those medications. So out of the 4,000 some odd drugs covered by uh, the government, there's still a number of medications that aren't covered by the med government. And in order for that to be covered, uh, the doctor nurse practitioner has to uh, go through uh, an immense amount of paperwork only to wait six weeks down the road for the letter to come back and say, no, we're not going to pay for it. Um, so we're going to be looking at a system, if we form government, to ex expedite that process, reduce the paperwork needed to do so, and hopefully uh, uh, with, with the savings we could find is expand uh, the uh, coverage, uh, expand the, the formulary uh, for Ontario Drug Benefit. We've also included in our platform that uh, we will cover all take-home cancer medications uh, for patients. Uh, right now, uh, they really only cover IV uh, cancer medications, which means you have to go to the hospital usually to get the treatment, which is another cost. Um, a lot of the newer medications being developed by drug companies, big pharma, are oral, uh, which means the newer medications aren't being covered by a government, so it means the patients of Ontario aren't getting the best cancer treatment possible or available. We're going to ensure that that coverage happens. Uh, we're going to make sure that take-home medications for cancer are covered for every Ontarian in this province. We're also going to look at increasing the coverage for rare disease medications. I couldn't tell you how many times uh, in my office I get uh, someone with cystic fibrosis, or, uh, and, and our science has gotten so uh, strong, uh, the evidence, uh, our ability to uh, diagnose uh, it's unbelievable that now many uh, intestinal ailments are becoming rare diseases because we can specify the treatment. These medications aren't being covered on the Ontario Drug Benefit Program. Um, we're looking at a way to develop a strategy to create a pool of money in order to expand the access uh, to rare disease medications because we don't think people need to fundraise, beg, borrow, steal, uh, take a mortgage out to pay for the medications to be healthy in this province. We need to make sure that uh, uh, those people on the edges 
uh, that have those rare diseases have access to that medication so that they can live a fulfilling life just like every other Ontarian. Lastly, uh, or second lastly in our platform, which I think is probably the, the biggest part of our healthcare platform, and, uh, and, and please note the funding for this uh, initiative isn't funded by uh, our, our carbon tax promise because people say there's a big hole because of the carbon tax. This part of the app, app uh, platform does not need carbon pricing in order to make it happen. Uh, it's our pledge for uh, re reinvigorating, redeveloping the mental health uh, system in Ontario. Uh, our party is committing to pledge uh, $1.9 billion in new money to match the federal government's $1.9 billion, so $3.8 billion in new spending solely for mental health in this province so that we can rebuild the system uh, in order to uh, fill the gaps that's been created uh, over decades upon decades of neglect of our mental health system. Uh, when you look at it, over the years in, in the late 1970s, mental health uh, funding in the health budget was around 11%. Uh, right now it sits between 5 and 6%. Uh, the Mental Health Commission recommends that provinces should have at least 9% of their budget going solely for mental health. Uh, this investment that we're putting in, in combination with the federal government will get us closer to 8% at the end of the day. It's not where we need to be, but it's a, a major step forward to where we should be. And. Uh, I find it very uh, uh, needed in this, in this uh, age. When I, when I talk about building up community mental health, uh, uh, community services, I look no further than children and youth mental health in, in our province. Uh, if you look at the latest stats, uh, over the last 10 years, uh, hospital admissions uh, due to mental health, mental illness in our youth is up 67%. Visits to our emergency rooms because of mental health for children and youth is up 63%. And that's because we haven't uh, built up the community services that are not available. If you look in London, the children and youth community uh, agencies, uh, they should do a fantastic job. Um, unfortunately, they haven't seen their budget, their base budget increase in over 10 years. Uh, the demand has shot through the roof. And because they haven't had uh, increased budget, uh, the salaries of their workers, and you probably uh, experience this in family health teams and community health centers, um, you can't compete with other jobs out there in the hospital or other fields. So what's happening is these uh, staff are doing an amazing job delivering the health care that's needed, but they can't keep them, so it's not consistent. And speaking with uh, uh, Addictions uh, Ontario, that's a huge problem when you're trying to help someone uh, cure their, their, their addiction. You develop this trust and faith and you work with this patient and only to have that person, uh, and, and no fault of their own. I don't blame anybody who could find a better paying job doing the same thing you're doing, but if they leave, that takes away that trust. So we need to ensure our community agencies are built up. And, uh, um, there's a good portion of, of, of the money that we're putting forward to build up their mental health in our province is going to be going to those community agencies that are delivering the care uh, for children and youth. And uh, we need to ensure that we can drive down those wait times so those that uh, uh, are needing mental health treatment aren't waiting 18 months. I always wait, bring this out. Uh, if my daughter broke her arm, she would see the doctor and if she needed surgery get it probably the next day or so and be home in a, in a matter of days or a week at max. If my daughter has a mental health problem and is thinking of killing herself, she may have to wait 18 months to get the help she really needs. That's not acceptable in this province. I don't think anybody would think it's acceptable. Our commitment is going to work to reduce that wait time to something that is acceptable and hopefully we can achieve that. And we're going to need RNAO, we're going to need RNs. We're going to need nurse practitioners, we're going to need pharmacists, we're going to need doctors on board. We're going to need to listen to you to collaborate in order to make this happen and make it a success. Because I'll tell you right now, the, the idea, the plan of how this is going to happen isn't going to be coming top down. It isn't going to be six or seven people in the back room deciding how it's going to do. We're going to sit down at a table and we're going to hammer out how we're going to deliver the services across the province because that's what we need to do. Each area of the province is different. We're going to have to make sure this healthcare system is flexible to those needs and ensure the supports are there. But the ideas are going to come from you, they're going to come from uh, uh, doctors groups, and they're going to be coming from patients. And we're going to fix this problem and we'll do it together. Um, lastly, but uh, not least, um, I, I do want to uh, uh, commend the work that RNs are doing in our province 
and uh, and know that uh, PC Party is uh, supportive of continuing the work to enable the uh, RNs to independently prescribe uh, in our province. We will continue that work if we form government. And um, we're also going to work to ensure that you have the ability to order labs. Because I don't know how you... <laughs> I'm not too sure how you can properly diagnose and prescribe a treatment when you aren't able to order and review the labs. They kind of go hand in hand, and we got to make sure that that's there with the RN prescribing. And uh, as Doris... <laughs> as Doris has mentioned, um, while we're at it, we need to see if we can put this in the education system so uh, after you graduate, you're not seeking to get your RN or, or, or your prescribing designation, that it's there for you once you graduate with a degree in this province. So we'll, we'll need to work together to ensure that happens. Uh, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, we're looking forward to continue working with RNAO. I know I do. I really appreciate the guidance, and I really appreciate the, appreciate the honesty that this organization has. And because you know Doris, I know Doris. Um, when I step out of line or say the wrong thing, I hear about it. And, I, I, and we need to continue that relationship going forward. And we need to have that partnership in order to make Ontario a better place to live, make our health care what we want it to be in this province, solely focused on the patient, working together with healthcare professionals, ensuring that it's delivered in a timely manner. So I want to thank you for your time. Appreciate being here. Next year, hopefully, uh, uh, we're in government and we have uh, our health minister will be speaking to you. If we're not and we're opposition again, I hopefully our leader will be here to uh, offer his thoughts or her thoughts, excuse me, her thoughts <laughs> on this uh, health care system. Thank you very much.